Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Now you can see my screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. So please mute your microphone so that we can avoid noise. So let's start our class today. We are discussing a hypothesis testing procedure. And this is the testing, you know, possibly you know uh, the concept of exit poll. So it is actually one task, so for the election analysis is concerned, where a cephalogist, he does exactly the hypothesis testing to predict the possibility of a winning party. So this is an example. So today we shall discuss about these steps that usually a cephalogist follows. So essentially he should have an idea about what is the distribution of his population. As I said, in majority of the real life situation, the population follows normal distribution. And if a population follows a normal distribution, then a sample also should follow the normal distribution. So the sampling distribution is also a normal distribution. Now what a cephalogist does is, so he collects samples from different constituency or assemblies and then get the data. So he acquired the data by means of collecting samples. And here, okay, size of the sample may be 300, 200, or maybe whatever the cephalogist can think suitable. So it is the sample data. So now, once the sample data is collect collected, so he follows five steps. So first step is to decide the two hypotheses, null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis. Uh, definitely, a lot of practice is required for a given hypothesis testing, how to choose the two hypotheses. So in this class, we shall discuss several case studies to understand this concept better. And it needs a little bit practice, that's all. Okay, practice, a little bit maturity or experience, then only you'll be prompt to decide the hypothesis. Once the hypothesis are decided, next task is to decide the significance level of the testing. So it is usually denoted as alpha. So a general practice to decide the significance level of testing is 5%. So here the idea is that 5% is the probability that in your testing, you can make an error. That is the significance level of hypothesis testing. And regarding this significance level, I shall discuss in details many other, right? Many other things involved here. Anyway, so the first step is deciding the null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis and consider a significance level of hypothesis which is usually expressed in the form of percentage. 1%, 2%, 5%, it is like this. Next, you have to decide which should be the sampling distribution that you want to use in your testing. You know, we have planned many sampling distribution, Z distribution, T distribution, chi-square distribution. Also, we have learned Ape distribution. There are four distribution techniques I have covered in this class. So which distribution you should follow? This is because sampling distribution essentially gives this kind of shape. And one particular sample should be located in a particular point which is shown here like for three samples it is shown here in three different colors so your sampling distributions highly influence your testing procedure that you have to choose is appropriately that is why you have to decide an appropriate sampling distribution for your hypothesis testing that is the second step 
and then third step you have collected the data that is the sample data from the sample data calculate the sample statistics maybe say sample mean sample variance and all those things so this is the third step and then fourth step making a decision whether based on your sample statistics and the sampling distribution that you have considered and with given significance level of hypothesis whether you will accept h0 or fail to accept h0 that means reject or fail to reject h0 whatever it is there so this is the decision making and then finally results reporting that means you should report the result in a very common language step 1 to 4 they are mathematical formulation but step 5 is a non formal expression so that any decision maker who does not know anything about the data analysis can understand the result so it is the five step the five steps involved final step is very trivial step it is uh, it is very simple now we shall discuss one by one each step involved and then we will uh, right we will explain we will illustrate with case studies now here again few things that should be noted here we have to choose between two hypotheses because i said that the two hypotheses are exclusive in nature that mean we have to choose any one if we accept a0 then eventually it said that h1 is rejected and vice versa the standard procedure is that initially without any testing you should assume that h0 is true so this is actually the standard procedure so far uh hypothesis testing is concerned. so basic assumption is that h0 is taken as this actually it is okay as i said i gave an example so for the courtroom scene is concerned it is a similar thing is that we presume innocent until the accused person is proven guilty that is the concept actually there so h0 the null hypothesis is considered initially as true and then our test our analysis is to to confirm it whether h0 is true or uh, reject it so it is the procedure that okay we should have sufficient reason to declare h0 as false now here what is the sufficient evidence that i will let you know actually that will be decided by your sampling distribution and then the test data that you have collected from the sample now here one important point is that this is very important that we reject h0 only when the chance is small that h0 is true otherwise h0 will be considered as true so there are some sufficient reason that's why sufficient reason to uh, okay declare that h0 is false that's, that is what i said actually and this procedure okay the hypothesizing procedure is based on the concept of probability theory and you no know, probability means chance this means that there is a chance that we can make errors and then definitely whenever we report the result the result should be with what is the error probability now whenever we say about the error then we can say that why error should come into the picture the error should come into the picture because of many reasons this is because see if you select a sample your sample may be okay small size or maybe your sample collection is an erroneous procedure so these are the two important sources which actually makes the uh, okay prediction as erroneous now let's see one by one the different steps involved first of all regarding the hypothesis we have been standing and we will learn many things whenever we will discuss with a study and the next is
Okay, so we have already learned about how to define the two hypotheses, null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis. And we'll, we shall discuss how to decide the two hypotheses given a problem. But before that, we should learn about the concept of significance level. I was telling that significance level is also sometimes it is called the confidence level. That means in order to predict a hypothesis or declare a hypothesis, whether it is true or false, how much you are confident. Now, confidence comes into the picture because if you are more confident, that means you say that I have less error. And if you are less confident means you can say that in your prediction, there is a possibility of error. So if you predict a hypothesis at random, so you can understand the confidence level or significance level is around 50%. That means 50% chance that you will make an error and 50% chance that your right prediction is correct. So it is like this. So random guessing or random prediction is with 50% confidence level. Now let's come okay, in details about what is the confidence level or significance level it is there. Now this level of significance coming into the picture of making an error. So in hypothesis testing, there are two types of errors involved. They are called type 1 error and type 2 error. So a type 1 error occurs when we reject H0 Obviously, incorrectly reject H0, but actually H0 is true. So this is the type 1 error. And type 2 errors, when we fail to reject H0, right? that means we accept H0, but H0 is not true. So this better can be explained using a table. And this table actually in statistical learning book called Confusion Matrix. Now, this Confusion Matrix, as you see, there are two rows. One is that H0 is declared as accepted. Another is H0 is declared as rejected. The two columns are there. One column H0 is true and another column H0 is false. Now, suppose H0 is true and you declare that H0 is true. So here is a right decision. Similarly, H0 is false and you declare that H0 is false, then your decision is also correct. So this, this is the two things are the correct, what is called the records. That means how much you can write in your learning or in your prediction, how much decisions are correct. So these two columns are basically total altogether gives you the accurate uh, what is called the prediction. On the other hand, these two entries here, one H0 is true, but you reject it. This leads to a type 1 error. And here, H0 is accepted, but actually H0 is not true. So this leads to a type 2 error. So these two entries in this right uh, are corresponding to the error entries. Okay, so and altogether, this is the correct entries plus error entries is actually the total number of decisions that you have made. And then percentage accuracy, percentage accuracy or percentage error that you can calculate by total number of correct decision divided by total number of decisions or total number of error, erroneous decision by total number of decision. It is the actually percentage of accuracy or percentage of error you can say. Anyway, so these are the two type of errors occurs there. Type 1 error and type 2 error. Now here, as I said, this is the percentage calculation I told you, right? So percentage calculation means the value should lie between 0 and 1, right? Inclusive. And this is OK. So 100% means it is exactly 1, and then 0% means it is 0. So this also alternatively can be expressed in the form of a probability. So here, alpha, say alpha denotes the probability of making a type 1 error. 
that means how much you can make an error type one error is actually the thing is that a0 is true but you made it false so alpha and this can be expressed in terms of your probability notation p rejecting h0 what is the probability that you will reject h0 but h0 is true so this will okay if we can express this probability using your concept of probability or theory of probability you will be able to get the values of alpha and this values of alpha lying between 0 to 1 both inclusive similarly type 2 error calculation also same way it is a p accepting h0 but h0 is false so these are the two alpha and beta are the probability values alpha denotes the what is the probability of making type 1 error and beta denotes what is the probability of making type 2 error now there are question the natural question that arises is that whether these values of alpha and beta are related to each other or one is dependent on other or vice versa all these things i should say yes alpha and beta are dependent on each other they are not independent actually the dependency in the sense that if one increases then other decreases and vice versa so usually obviously so far our application is concerned the alpha value should be as low as possible beta value should be as low as possible but type 1 error is most significant so far reporting the result is concerned i'll tell you why it is so significant and another point that you should note and we can prove it with some examples and then calculation also that if the size of the sample increases then the probability of making both the error in fact decreases this is obvious because lesser sample size means more what is called the probability of making errors so it is the thing is that you can test it you can prove it we can uh, okay explain it with many data collection activities and then we can check it so this is actually the sampling error right so sampling error usually increases when the sample size is small and sampling error can be reduced when the sample size is large you can you can note down the standard error that we can express sigma by root over n and if n has the large value means error is less it is like that concept okay and error is less means both alpha and beta will be less now here in general we focus on type 1 error but type 2 error is also important now here again i should explain why i said so why the type 1 error is important compared to type 2 error the concept it is like this again i can draw the courtroom scenario as an example say suppose one accused right he should not be penalized until he is proven that okay he made the crime that is why right so the the thing is that even the law judges also say that uh, the innocent should not be penalized under any situation so if a particular criminal can get excused but under any situation no innocent will be uh, uh, okay penalized without any his fault it is like this so type 1 error is actually you are innocent but we are declaring that you made crime so it is the error so we will try to reduce this type 1 error as much as possible and then type 2 error means okay fine he made crime but because of the uh, okay lapse of uh, evidence or the records or whatever the things so he may declare that okay he didn't make any crime so it is the concept so that is why so type 1 error is more uh, significant so far the error calculation is concerned but at the same time i should not say that type 2 error also no a i mean less significant it is also important but usually uh, type 1 error is considered as the most important than the type 2 error now here type 1 error how it is related to this alpha or the level of significance that needs more explanation and then more discussion now i can start with an example suppose there is a testing procedure uh, where h0 and h1 is declared as like mu equals to a and mu is not equals to a so are the two hypotheses where a is uh, a constant 
right, is a value, and mu is the population mean. So here hypothesis is that uh, mean is equals to a, right? And initially it is assumed as true. And the alternative alternate hypothesis that the mean is not equals to a. Now here one thing mu equals to a to prove it whether you should allow some deviation from the value of a or not. That means whether mu equals to a is a single point declaration or it is actually with a uh, with an interval declaration. What I want to say, say suppose mean score that you want to consider in your examination is that it is 50 out of 100. Now, so 50 is fine, but should we consider 50.1 also countable towards the mu equals to 1 or 49.9 should be considered or maybe 50.5 and 49.5 should be considered. So although 50, but near about 50, there are some neighboring values also very close to this value, then we can take it. Actually, if we do so, then it essentially reduce your error. So that is why a little bit level of significance says that let this null hypothesis A0 be true within the range A plus minus delta. A plus delta and A minus delta, where delta is very small values, of course, it should be zero, okay, in, uh, okay, in real, in, in ideal case, but in real case, it should be a non-zero value. Okay, that means they are significantly different from A. So delta value will decide how the hypothesis, hypothesis will be significantly different from the other values of the mean value prediction. So A plus minus delta. Now here, if we plot the graph here, you possibly to understand. So, so here actually it is actually mean variations, right? Mean variation. And so if we say delta, delta somewhere here like, so depends on, so let, let it be delta. So A minus delta, okay. So it is actually your A value and it is actually it is actually a minus delta value. And similarly here, so it is, sorry, uh, similarly here, it is delta value. So it is actually we say a plus delta. Now here we can understand that this is the boundary that we are fixing so that the value of A, which will be considered as the predicted value, so far the null hypothesis is concerned. Okay, and this is the interval, right? This is the interval of the value of A towards the prediction value. And here, these sides, right? And you can understand that, okay, if any sample gives some value within this region, then they will be considered as a rejected one. And this will be considered as a accepted one. So here, this way, the level of significance come into the picture. Now, this can be more clearly can be expressed in terms of probability. Here, the probability here alpha says it is like this, that here x bar is actually your samples mean or sample statistics value. So it is less than a minus delta here. So this is the probability that the x bar, that means the sample mean that you have collected is less than a minus delta plus the sample mean is greater than a plus delta. So it is, this is this. When mu is equals to a, that is actually your mean prediction. And here you can see this is actually a zero H two, right? Okay. So this way, uh, the sided region, which we have mentioned here is the probability of making type one error. 
That is, I said that this is alpha. So as I said already, what is the total area under this car? The total area under this car is equals to one. And this value is right something less than one. And then this value plus this value and this value altogether makes equals to one. And if we consider it a strictly normal distribution, they are symmetric. Then this region and this region are equal, right? Because it is equidistance from this A, A minus delta and A plus delta. So if it is suppose 95, okay, is a 5% in this area region, then this is actually 95% of the area. And out of this 5% of the error probability, if this alpha is equals to 5%, then this is actually 2.5% and this is equals to 2.5%. So it is a 0 0.025 is the area of this region, 0 0.025 is the area of this region, and 0.95 is the area of this region, shaded region, white region. So this is the concept of alpha that come into the picture that if your sample, right, lying within this region, and whatever the sample value said, and that is actually your right prediction. And if your sample value lying in this region, whether this region or this region, then you can say that the sample prediction, right? Sample value says that your prediction should be right towards the rejecting the hypothesis that A0 is not equal to A. Now here, this is the concept that comes into the picture. Now we have therefore understood about a boundary. This boundary can clearly explain, so far your sampling distribution curve is concerned, two regions. One is the acceptable region, another is the rejection region. Now the rejection region, right, are the two sides, depending on what hypothesis you are considering. I'll discuss these things in details, right, and then so they are actually the probability. Okay, so they are probability and then their value, that means the region will have its value less than one, it is like that. Now let's come to the concept of this, the significance of the different values of alpha. If I say alpha equals to 0%, if I say alpha equals to 0%, that means this rejection region is zero. So this is zero. That means if you go there and there, then what is the concept that concept is that the entire right region under this is a acceptable region. Now here the thing is that whatever be the sample that you collect, and then based on the sample data, you predict that your hypothesis is true. So this is one example of ultra liberal test. So alpha equals to zero percent means accepts always the null hypothesis as true. In contrast, other extreme, if alpha equals to 100. So if alpha equals to 100, then the entire region are the rejection region. Then whatever be the sample that you can collect, and from the sample data, you have to reject the null hypothesis. So this is an, another extreme example, and it is an example of ultra conservative test. Definitely these two values of alpha is not a realistic value. You should not select it. Now let's see what is the realistic value for the alpha likely to be. I say one example, say alpha equals to 1% here and another maybe alpha equals to 5%. So two are the realistic value, but how they are comparable. So alpha equals to 1% signifies that it is a lesser probability to reject a, a zero and alpha equals to 5% is comparatively with higher probability to reject a null hypothesis. So it is the concept it is, and there is a reasonable okay, justification, and usually the standard practice in many hypothesis testing to take the value of alpha is in between 1% and 5%, and usually it is 5%. So if I don't say anything, it is taken that alpha is equals to 5%. That is a standard values for the alpha or level of significance. 
Now here you should understand. I think you have uh, okay. I think you will agree with this, with that. Alpha is the maximum acceptable probability of rejecting a true null hypothesis. So if alpha is five percent, that means point zero five is the maximum probability of rejecting a true null hypothesis. The hypothesis is true, but we are rejecting it. You can understand that so tie point error probability is therefore less, and it is alpha. And beta, if I ask you what is the probability, okay, probable value for beta if alpha equals to five percent? Yes, if you say ninety-five percent, then it is a bit difficult to write uh, second it. But I should say that if alpha is very less value, at the same time. Uh, beta is actually very high value as i said that okay alpha and beta are reciprocating to each other if one is large then another is small and vice versa it is there but alpha usually is very small value so there beta is also very larger value and larger value means it is if it is not exactly 95% for alpha equals 5% but very close to 90% or so i will give you the calculation of this alpha and beta value at the end of this discussion not today tomorrow so you'll be able to understand the clear picture of alpha and beta concepts so for hypothesis testing is concerned but now i am in a mood to teach you the concept of different steps now so far i have completed one step that is the step 1 step 1 is uh, deciding the two hypothesis null and alternate hypothesis and bit idea about the significance level at the alpha now here again few things that you should include in your discussion so far the different hypothesis composition is concerned you can recall the null hypothesis is always with equal sign but the alternate hypothesis can be with less than sign or is greater than sign or not equal sign if null hypothesis is with either less than or greater than symbol sorry sir if the alternate hypothesis is either with less than or greater than symbol then such a hypothesis testing is called one tail test on the other hand if alternate hypothesis with is with equal not equals to sign then this is called two tail test so this is an example of a two tail test and if the alternate hypothesis takes this form then this is called one tail test now for two tail test and one tail test the alpha value will be different actually okay so here if it is a two tail test that mean it can be greater than as well as less than if both are applicable this implies that rejection median will be at the both side of these things that we have already discussed so in the initial discussion that i made just now they are related to the two tail test actually so in case of two tail test there are two rejection regions at the left tail and then right tail right tail means if the sample value is greater than some values and then less than uh, left side means left tail means it is less than this one so it is like this so if it is not equals then it the sample can give you both less than or greater than and in that case two rejection regions are there but in that case if alpha value right will be divided equally among the two rejection if alpha equals to 5% for example so 2.5% is at the right side of the rejection region and 2.5% is at the left side of the rejection and at the middle it is the accepted region it is 95% of the total area so this is the two tail test now in case of one tail test again if it is less than so for example it is less than then it is called the left tail test and it is actually an example is a greater than so it is called the right tail test so in case of left tail test the rejection region is at the one end only and if it is a 5% is the alpha value then this region area of this region is 0.5 similarly if it is 5% but right tail test then area of this region is there and you can see the entire sites in this region are in the acceptance region similarly in this case also entire region at this end is the acceptance region 
so it is actually example of greater than right uh, the values and it is an example of less than value so to tell test are there so on tell test this is and then two tell test is there so you have to little bit careful about whether if it is a two tell test so then your rejection region is equally right at the both end so alpha value should be distributed in both sides as alpha by 2 is one side and alpha by 2 is another side and on the other hand if it is one tail test so only alpha value is one side and depending on less than or greater than it will be either left side or it is at the right side okay so this is the rejection region now here again few more question that is there so how to choose this rejection boundary because i said that here this boundary right so here is the boundary right how i can decide this boundary this boundary or this boundary right or even in the two tail test this boundary right this is the one boundary this is the one boundary so who will decide this boundary or this boundary or how to decide this boundary yes you are right that okay if given the alpha i shall be able to choose the value of this boundary region that mean what is this point value actually and what is this point value for a right one tail test or for two tail test what is the point value this one because that is actually a minus delta and a plus delta like right so if you have given this is actually a and then if this alpha is given then possibly you will be able to calculate a minus delta and a plus delta so that is obviously that's fine but there is some standard method and as you say as i already told you this is a probabilistic value so we can solve this problem better using the probability calculation so here is an example that the rejection reject, reject, rejection boundary we can choose it very correctly uh, there are two ways of course the first way that i'm going to discuss right now it is when alpha is given to you that means it is 5% or 1% whatever the value it is given there then there is a procedure to find it and then next is uh, so given the rejection boundary how the alpha can be calculated so the two things are complement each other so let us first consider you have given the value of alpha then how to decide the boundaries of the rejection region so here we can start with the definition of alpha is a type one error that mean a0 is rejected but a0 is true so in terms of probability z falls in the rejection region when a0 is true here z actually the sample statistics now this is actually what is the probability that z is less than z0 when a0 equals to mu it is actually uh, the left tail or if it is right tail z is greater than z0 when a0 is equal so this is uh, the two uh, cases for the one tail are be less than or greater than and it is actually the probability calculation for the two tail test so z greater than z0 this when h equals to mu plus p z less than z0 when h0 equals to mu this is for the two tail test now here z0 or z0 dash they are actually deciding the rejection boundary and it is our task that how these two value z0 dash or z0 right can be calculated given that alpha is given i can start with an example so that you can understand so this is an example let us consider uh, so here mean is given to you 8.0 and standard deviation because these two things are required so far you can understand that okay what's with the shape of the your um, sampling distribution and then right and then size of the sample is 16 so this is the uh, right input to your problem is given and here we have to decide the rejection boundaries they are also sometime called critical values for the rejection region critical value for rejection region and this is the alpha value that is given to you so here alpha equals to 0.05 now here critical values let's see c1 and c2 are the two tail test okay and if it, okay the same okay so let us consider that it is first two tail test so the two rejection boundary and let they are c1 and c2 so we can say alpha equals to this one and plus this one and in terms of this c1 and c2 we can write so it is actually z0 dash so if this is actually c1 right then you know the z transformation if we can apply so x bar minus mu divided by sigma root over n 
and it is actually if it is right tailed then we can say this is the probability that if given this c1 the z will be greater than this one and here this is the left tail c2 minus 8.0 0.2 by 16 so these are two z values and in terms of this probability calculation we can write it so this is the standard thing that is there so far the sampling distribution is concerned it is there this way you can calculate probability given a sampling distribution like this one now because of the symmetry of the normal distribution these two terms this and this plus contributes in equal amount so we can say so this is this is equals to this is and all together this is equals to 0.05 so we can say this plus this equals to 0.05 that means this is equals to 0.025 as well as this is equals to 0.25 now here this is the concept that we can see how we can calculate given this kind of things the value of c2 this calculation usually we can do if we take into confidence about the z distribution table now so there are okay there in the z distribution there are two type of z distribution one is called this is actually example of right tail z distribution table and left tail z distribution table the table will say z greater than some values what is the probability it will calculate on the other hand if its probability is given then if z is less than this or z is greater than for what value of it is there now i can show you one table so that we can understand uh, in this context so what is the value of z so that the probability will be right will be is equals to 0.025 i can show you one table so that you can uh understand the concept it is there so i am showing one table here okay now here i am showing one table and it is a z distribution table and from this table you know so this is actually a left tail table right so left tail table means it says that what is the probability of z less than z0 right and here uh, so 0.025 that mean actually it is a uh, it is actually less than z0 so we take the values of this one minus whatever the value it is given there so for example uh, here 0.0025 right point sorry 0.025 now let's see 0.025 is corresponding to 0.9750 so where is the entry 0.9750 in this table that we can find it so here i can see uh, here uh, 0 0.9750 is this entry is there right here this entry is there 0 0.9750 now this actually says that for some z greater than z0 this value is 0 0.9750 or it will be less than then 0 0.0250 and this value is 1.9 and here is a 0 0.06 so 1.96 right 1.9 this table and then 0 0.06 so total 1.96 so we can say that 0 0.025 is this pz0 table this size is corresponding to point uh, corresponding to 1.96 is the probability that means this is the area of this region for which probability that z is less than z0 is equals to okay so it is z0 is 1.96 so probability that z is less than 1.96 is area is 1.95 1.96 now so th this table you have to little bit follow it so that you can understand about it so what again let's coming back to this discussion here so so this actually z0 so this probability is equals to 0 0.025 corresponding to this value is 1.96 okay so this corresponding to this value is 1.96 which we write uh, take from the table so here we can say therefore uh, this is equals to 1.96 and this is equals to 1.96 again so if we solve it the two values then we can get it 
C1 is 8.098 and C2 is 7.02. Now here again, you see this is the positive sign because it is in the right side. And this is the negative side because in the Z distribution, mu is at zero. So this value in the minus negative side. So it is negative value is taken there. You can see the statistical table from different sources. They have the different format, but you have to little bit okay adapt to a particular format which it gives it. But it will tell you that is a probability. It will tell always the it will the entries in the Z distribution table is the probability value, and this probability value for some Z values. So whether Z greater than Z zero value or it is Z less than Z zero value, and this Z value can be varying from. Okay, here in this table, as I said, uh, for example, in this table again, right? Uh, as I okay shown there, uh, in this table, as you see, uh, so here the table values. That means Z value varies from zero to three point six. Actually, essentially, it varies from minus three point six to zero. Actually, because one, you can take the one minus this value, it will take you the these sides according to this one. But there are many other distribution table which gives only the certain region this point. That means entries are in this region, values are there. So in that case, you don't have to make one minus direction there. Okay. So it depends on. So you can you just little bit have an idea about how to consult the table so that you can uh, get the value from there. Because you have to ha deal with the table consultation whenever some problem is given. So practice is required. I'll show you many other. Instances how to consult the statistical table. Anyway, so with reference to this problem, as you see, the C1 that is the right boundary and C2 the left boundary. We could calculate the right boundary is 8.098 and left boundary is calculated as 7.902. So it is like this. Okay. So this way we can calculate. This is the rejection boundary. That means your rejection region start from 8.098 towards the right and this one. Now this is exactly example of two tail test. Now if it is a right tail test, then this okay if it is say greater than I mean right values, then this is equal to 0 0.050. Then you have to take the table and where the NT 0 0.50 for which you can get this value. So you getting this value to that so that C1 the Right boundary can be calculated, or if it is a left tail test, then left boundary can be calculated. So the procedure is same. You can repeat the same procedure, but only for the left tail test, on tail test, either left tail or right tail. Also, you can check, and then accordingly you will be able to calculate. So this is a simple algebra. Okay. So this way, I explain that given a value of alpha, how you can calculate rejection boundary, because in your statistical testing procedure you first know the rejection region boundary because this is the step one right the step one is that null hypothesis alternate hypothesis given a significance levels decide the rejection boundary so this is the step there as an alternative to that how you can decide the value of alpha if the rejection boundary is given to you now this is an example that you can think about it say the two rejection boundary that is given to you one is x bar 7 point less than 7.9 and another is 8.1. So it is like this. So this is the rejection boundary given to you. One is at 7.9, another is 8.1. Now you have to calculate what is the value of alpha. Let it be two tail test again. So if it is a two tail test and mu is 8.0, mu is 8.0 here and sigma is 0 0.02, sample size is 16 for this problem. Then we can write the alpha in terms of this probability definition that z greater than this one plus z less than this one. So this actually is this after simplification it gives 2.0 and minus 2.0. So here uh, this actually is a z0 that is a z0 value right and this z0 value with certain probability as I said. So it is a 2.0 again you consult the table if p z greater than 2.0 that means 2.0 and you see the 0.0 NT which is there. So you can see that it is 0.228. And similarly, this is also equal amount because the area is always a positive quantity. So it is there and altogether you can say that it is 0.0456. This means that 
the area bounded by this region is 0.228 and area by, bounded by this region is 0.228 and this is actually the total uh, okay sum of the two regions area regions is comprises to the values of alpha so alpha is equals to 0.0456 which is approximately 0.05 or 5 percent you can say now again you, if i ask you to repeat for the one tail test the same thing in that case this will come to you directly from 0.456 it is there so only one one side but the area is 0.0456 either this sides or this sides depending on less than greater than right so this is the two examples that i say and you can follow that given the alpha how rejection boundary can be chosen and given the rejection boundary how the value of alpha can be chosen so a little bit probability calculation and consulting the jet table these things are there i advise you to follow it you can take the slides and then follow the table and check yourself so that you can understand the concept very clearly this is very important because in question in your test the problem will be given you have to solve the problem and to the to solve the problem you have to consult the table so if you are not right familiar to the table consultation then you may feel it difficult to answer the uh, problem so that is very important now so we have discussed about first step first step is the decide null hypothesis alternate hypothesis given the level of significance what is the rejection boundary this is the step one now second step that is the sampling statistics for testing i told you that you have to collect a sample data and from the sample data you calculate the statistics value that means what is the mean what is the variance standard deviation etc so this is a quite simple process and further another thing is that which sample distribution that you should follow in your hypothesis testing that is also important now in this regard there are mainly three distribution tables are used one is z distribution t distribution and chi square and all these distribution sampling distribution you can recall from my discussion also are valid provided that population follows the normal distribution so assumption of normality is must to hold good to apply this one now again with the z distribution so assume that your population follow normal distribution so your population is normally distributed from here you have collected your sample now next is which distribution you should consider because in statistical books there are three distribution z t and chi square so we have to consider that which distribution is there while i was discussing these three distributions right sampling distribution that time i also gave an idea about it but i am repeating again so z test is applicable right if your population follow normal distribution and you have to compare sample mean to population mean that mean from sample mean you have to predict population mean and one condition is that population variance is known so here you can see uh, this is the formula to calculate z value from a given sample statistics so x bar is from your sample mean mu is to compare with your population mean sigma it is known if it is known sample size is anyway it is known to you so if it is known so these are known and you have to compare this sample mean with population mean to do these things it will give a z value and take this z value into your calculation and then based on this z value you just consider the distribution table that okay whether this z value lying within this region i mean acceptance region if this z value lying within this acceptance region then a0 is acceptable and if it is if it does not then it is rejectable so this is the concept again now so z test is applicable when the population follow normal distribution and we have to compare population mean with the sample mean and population variance is known on the other hand t test it is applicable again the population follows normal distribution 
and usually t test is applicable even the small sample size is given to you and then another important is that population variance is not known now here is the formula as you see uh, it is similar to the z distribution formula only the difference you can note that it is s this is actually the sample statistic that means sample standard deviation now having these are the all values so t value can be calculated now this t value needs to be consulted whether this t value is within the critical region or not if the t value is inside the critical region that means rejection region then the hypothesis null hypothesis should be rejected and if it is within the acceptance region then it has to be accepted so this t value needs to be right calculated from the given sample provided that population variance is not known as the population variance is not known we use the sample variance in our formula okay and this way we can get the t value so it is the matter of z value or matter of t value z value then we have to z test t value then it is t test if it is a z value then consult z distribution table if t value then you can consult t distribution table so this is the t test now here all these test more fondly it is called parametric test because these are the parameters x bar mu s sigma they are parameters that is why testing based on all these parameters and that is why hypothesis testing is also alternatively called parametric test so whether z test t test chi square test all are parametric test actually and this is the example of t test and you can understand that when you have to apply t test it is simple that population variance is known if it is known z test if it is not known t test that's all that is very simple and now next chi square test chi square test is not to compare population mean sample mean it is only to compare the population variance so from the sample data you have to predict about population variance if it is there then you can follow this chi square test and again it is also not the population from where you collect samples should follow the normal distribution that is obvious and it is there now here in this formula again you see how this chi square value can be calculated n is the size of the sample and actually n minus 1 is called the degree of freedom of the sample so it is n minus 1 degree and s you know this s is the sample standard deviation s square is variance and sigma square is population variance so if these values are known and you have to com what uh, compare these value then you have to take the confidence of chi square so whether sigma square is acceptable right it will be decided by the chi square again there is a critical region that mean rejection region and acceptance region if this chi square value is inside the rejection region then whatever the population variance you assume it is to be rejected and if it is in acceptance region so that mean chi square value is less than the critical value of the rejection region then you have to accept it that mean the assumed variance is comparable to the population variance so this is the concept so again i repeat z test you apply when population variance is known t test you apply when population variance is not known and chi square test is applicable for the variance right prediction that mean testing right on the other hand z test and t test for population mean prediction predicting population mean or inferring population mean from the sample mean z test and t test and chi square inferring samples in inferring population variance from the sample variance that's also it is again clear which test distribution you have to apply then it is also clear and then okay i will show you how to consult uh, t test and chi square test in the same way the z test that we have used it i'll i'll uh, okay whenever i'll discuss the case study that time i'll discuss it here now uh, how to find the t value z value and chi square value uh, there is again obviously if you want to follow usually if you write a program in python or matlab and everything so there is a library which will calculate uh, all these values automatically either consulting a table of database 
or it is from the air. And then there is okay manually if you want to do it for solving problems in exams, right, examinations or like that, then we usually consult uh, uh, statistical table and keep uh, right, uh, okay, uh, postponing it right now because whenever I will take the example, that time I will show you how to consult the table. And the tables uh, I have already uh, shared with you in the share point so that you can get it from there. Otherwise, from the net also, you can download uh, the tables. I have downloaded from the net itself. And from the end of the book, any book, right? If you have the ebook or something like, say, wall poll or whatever it is there, at, at the end of the book, you always find uh, the several uh, probability distribution table as well as the uh, sampling distribution table. So that is available there. And now here, let us first discuss one by one uh, different case studies uh, related to the different test. So let, let us first start with a T test. I'll tell you one example and I'll see, I'll tell you how to solve this example. So five steps I have already told you. So we have to just, okay, in order to perform a hypothesis testing for a particular case that is given to you, we have to actually follow the five steps one by one. So let us first the case one, which actually how it sets you. So suppose a coffee vendor, like say Siru coffee or something like, uh, nearby in Alanda Academic Complex has been having average sales of 500 coffee per day, 500 cups per day. So it is actually the normal, uh, what is called the record sales record. It says that the vendors sell around uh, 500 copies per day on the average. Now, because of the development of another, another academic wings in the complex, it expect to increase its sale. During the, okay, so it is actually, this is a hypothesis. Hypothesis is that possibly I'm going to increase my sale. So vendor can assume it. Whether vendor decision is correct, because based on this decision, whether he will consider another boy in his shop or he will reduce the number of person, okay, uh, supporting uh, people in his vendor. All, all those things is actually for the decision making, but he wants to know whether his sale has increased or decrease or remain same. It is like this, okay? And we want to convert this into a hypothesis testing formula. Now, during the first 12 days, so if the sample is collected for the 12 days sale, it is okay, consider that, okay, randomly or first 12 days, whatever it is there. And then the different sales that is obtained, which is mentioned here. In the first day, 550, second day, 570, and then 12 day, it is 526 and so on. So this is the sample data that has been collected and given to you. And based on the sample data, you have to test the hypothesis that whether the coffee vendor has increased the sale or not. And consider 5% as the significance level of testing. Here alpha is equals to 5%. Now I hope this problem is clear. You have given a sample of size 12 and this is the sample data. So here we have to predict the hypothesis that mu equals to 500 because is the average cell usually he is having or mu is greater than 500 because he could increase his cell. Okay, so based on this problem, our first step is to decide the null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis. Uh, these are the five steps, we will follow one by one. So the null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis, I told you, null hypothesis you should consider with equal sign and mu, that is the population mean, that means his average coffee cell is 500 cups per day. And then alternate hypothesis is that if he could increase his cell, so mu is greater than 500. And given the value of alpha, 0.05. Now, if you have given the values of alpha equals to 0 0.05, I have already told you how to find the rejection boundary. And it is the one tail test. We can find it usually from the T distribution table easily. Now let's come to the picture here. So here the sample based test statistics and the rejection region for specified zero that we have to calculate it. Now from the, from the sample data, we can calculate t value. To calculate t value, we should know x bar. 
So x bar can be calculated from this data, calculating the mean of this data. So x bar can be calculated easily. Mean is actually the compare, comparable mean that is 500. S. Now in this case, you can tell which statistics I should follow. I am telling that t test. Why I am telling t test? Because in this problem statement, it didn't say anything about population variance, so that is known or not. So from the problem statement, we don't have any idea about the population variance. Therefore, z test cannot be applied here. And as we have to compare the mean, so the remaining test that is available to us, the remaining option is the t test. So it is actually the t test. So the t value can be obtained, x value, x bar value that can be obtained from the sample data, s value also can be obtained from the sample data. So s value can be obtained. N is actually your sample size, that is already told that it is n equals to 12. Mu is assumed mean, that is the hypothesized mean, the 500. So here is the formula how x bar can be calculated from the data. X bar is calculated as 548 and then that variance S also can be calculated. For the variance calculation, we need xi minus x bar whole square for all xi. So this is a contingency table for each xi, the 12 data, xi minus x bar is calculated. X bar is calculated previously and this is the square is calculated and this is the summing and this will be the sum. And this sum divided by n minus 1, it will give you the variance S. So it's the standard deviation actually S and that is values as 46.68. Now having this X bar and S and mu is 500, n is 12, we shall be able to calculate T value. So this T value is calculated this one. Now this is actually T value that we have calculated given the sample data. So here T value is 3.58 as it is shown here. Now we have to check that whether this T value lying in the rejection region or it is in the acceptance region. Now our next step, our step three is to decide the rejection region. Now this rejection region, that means this is the critical value, right? The boundary can be obtained given that alpha value. So alpha value, it is given to you. You can calculate using the formula that I have told you, but here the T distribution table needs to be consulted. So here the T, T table, actually the entry of the T table, if you see, it needs the information about what is the degree of freedom. As I said, for this 12 data, degree of freedom is 11. So this is the degree of freedom for the data 11. So in order to consult the T table, we need two input. One is the degree of freedom and what is the level of confidence. And there are again two tail and one tail test. So depending on two tail 5%, one tail 5%, the different T tables are there. So according, we have to follow it. And from this okay table, for 11 degrees of freedom with 5%, we can check that the T value is 1.796. Now let us consider, uh, let us consider the T table this, uh, okay, consultation so that we can understand the T table here. I'm showing the T table. Uh, so this is a normal distribution table and here is the T table, okay? Should I increase the size of the screen so that you can see it very clearly, right? Here, okay, I think this is clearly visible, right? Now here you can see it, okay, sorry. Okay, now 11 is the degree of freedom. Here you see the rows includes the different degrees of freedom. So 11 degrees of freedom, and for this problem, one tail test, so 5%. So it is this column. So this rows and this column, and we can see 1.796 is the value of the entry. That means this is actually the critical boundary for this test, T test. That means 1.796. Now here, following this 1.796, as you see here, here I also show you, this is the T, the critical value, that means these are boundary values for the rejection region is 1.796. Now, so here now we are in the process of making a decision whether the hypothesis, null hypothesis to be rejected or accepted. As you see, the critical boundary is 1.796. And your test value, 
that is obtained based on the uh, sample. So this is the sample right value, and it is obtained as 3.55. And as this value is in the rejection region, this means that based on the sample data, we have to reject the hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is rejected in this case, and this rejection with probability of error. The probability of error is 0 0.05. So we reject the null, null hypothesis with 0 0.05 or 5% 5 is the error, right? That H0 is true. Okay, so this is the test case one. I hope you have understood sir, it. Sir, 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 one second. Yeah, sorry, sorry. sure. Sir, can, you, can you go back to the previous slide? Sure, sure. Yeah. So 3.558 value came from where? 3.55 value oh, came oh, from sorry, sorry, sample sorry. data collection. I can tell you here. This is the sample data I have collected. Oh, okay. okay. And then I calculated the mean and then standard deviation and then T value I have calculated using this formula. That is actually, okay. Uh, this T value I have calculated using this formula, right? So I, from the sample data, I calculate X bar. So X bar is calculated from the sample data. S is also calculated from the sample data. Mean is hypothesized mean. I have to compare this mean with the population. N is the sample data size, okay? This is 48, 46.6812 is the value. And then 3.558 is calculated. So from the sample data, right? It's okay? Yes, sir, yes, sir, it's fine. Okay, good. And this T value I calculate from the statistical T distribution table. T distribution table needs what is the degree of freedom and what is the alpha value. So given two value, you will be able to find T values. Again, T value, whenever you consult T distribution table, be careful whether it is a two-tail test or one-tail test. Now, this is an example of a one tail test. So I have consulted T distribution table for one tail. That's okay. So this way I could test this hypothesis. So now you can see in a common man language, what is the interpretation of the test is that that sample data says or our hypothesis testing says that coffee sale have increased. That means vendor can take this decision into his action, whatever it is there. Okay, so this is the test procedure here, and I hope you are able to follow it. Now, there are many catches. So one thing is that you can, okay, you didn't argue me, and that time I didn't, okay, point it out also. So you can see null hypothesis is fine for me, mu equals to 500. But so far the alternate hypothesis is concerned that we have considered mu greater than 500. You could argue that, why it is mu greater than 500? Why not mu less than 500? Now, if I say so, mu less than 500, do you think that uh, the result will be different or the result will be different? Further, another possibility that I could consider mu not equals to 500, right? Now, so there are two different other options are there. Definitely, if you consider mu not equals to 500, it should come under the two-tail test and then T value will be a little bit different. It will be higher for the two-tail test. And then definitely the result, the outcome of the result may be different. Now here my question is that, which is the right choice? So far this hypothesis uh, decision is concerned here. I have considered mu equals to 500, mu is greater than 500. But if, do you think that, okay, I'll make, uh, okay, wrong analysis if I say mu less than 500, or do you say that I will make wrong analysis if I take mu not equals to 500? Now here, I'm telling you, so this answer lies in the problem statement here. So this problem statement, actually, they are interested to know about whether coffee sale has increased or not. So as it is the concern of increasing, so we have to test this hypothesis, actually. So whether it is increased or not. So if it is the hypothesis that to, to test whether a sale is increased or not, so I should say that mu greater than 500, right? 
if it is asked that whether my cell remains same, then I could say that, okay, it is not equals to 500 or uh, change whatever it is there. So mu equals to 500 it is a de facto standard that we always take it. That means we assume that there is no increase in the cell. So mu equals to 500. And next uh, hypothesis is that cell has increased. So that is why mu greater than 500. So, so far this problem statement is concerned. It is quite justified to take this value, not mu less than 500. However, if you take mu less than 500, all the steps in calculation will remain same. Therefore, your interpretation and then inference also will remain same. It will not change. But if it is not equals to 500, then your result will be different, inference will be different. Only that's one. Otherwise, it is nothing. Next point that you can think about, that you have given that alpha is 5%. But what will be the result if we consider alpha equals to 0 0.01? Now, this answer can be given again because alpha is 1%. So alpha equals to 1%. So we can consult this T distribution table for the same degrees of freedom 11, but with one tail test, and it is the 1% confidence level. That means 1.796, so it will be 2.718. So this is the critical boundary will shift from 1.796 to 2.215. But even though, so they are also, I think your inference will not change because uh, your inference also will not change because uh, that is also, okay, whether it is, uh, the T value that you have calculated based on the stamp sample data is 3.58558. And then the new two value that is 2.2196. So this is still in the rejection region. Anyway, so this is the example here. But again, if I say it, if it is not 5%, if it is say 10% confident, means I just okay making more errors, but I want to test it. That means with 10%. Again, if you consult the test table and then your outcome may be different, right? And your outcome will be different. Or if you decrease the rejection region further below 1%, say so maybe 0.1%, then also your right boundary can shift. And then, okay, which is acceptable? Because if you reduce the values of alpha, your rejection region will be reduced. And as a consequence, for the higher values of alpha, which is acceptable, for, for a lower value of alpha, the same sample data can be appear as rejectable. So it depends on. Now, again, this is an issue. So which alpha value should be considered? Whether it is specified or is a standard practice or you have to choose it. Now, this answer I will give you after completion of all the case studies. So let us first visit all the case studies and then I will come to the discussion of the uh, possibilities of alpha values or the choosing right alpha values. So this is another discussion. The separate discussion is required. And then I'll okay make this discussion later on. So let's start about sir? second case study. Sir? Yes, please. Sir, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? This slide? Sir. Yes, sir. Sir, even if we put H1 as new less than 500, the answer will not, like it will still be in a rejection part rather than in the acceptance part. So yes. we will come back to the same position, right? Yes. Here actually see, that is correct. What will be the interpretation? What is the interpretation there? Yeah, in that case, it will be like, uh, you, I, I, I'm rejecting H1. We are rejecting H1, so. So we are rejecting H, we are, no. We are rejecting here. Actually, we, we have rejected H0. Is not it? Okay. We have rejected H0. That means mu is not 500. Yes. This means that alternate hypothesis, if you say less than 500, then okay, it is okay that 500 is there. But whenever it is like this, so I'm telling you, you listen to me first mu equals to 500, this is my assumed hypothesis. And based on this testing, I reject the hypothesis with 5% possibility probability of error. Is okay? Now, so 
we are rejecting this hypothesis implying that implying that coffee cell does not remain same because mu equals to 500 remain same so i can say that it does not remain same right this is fine right now it does not remain same implies again two things whether it is increased or whether it is decreased now what is your conclusion whether it is increased or decreased what is your conclusion Right now, the conclusion is we are. Yeah, so conclusion is ambiguous. Yes, it can be anything. Because you are not able to confident, OK, confidently give the answer whether increase or decreased. So is a 50% chance that it's increased, 50% chance is decreased. Are you clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm okay. understanding. Yeah. Now, so then how to live with this decision? Because this is an ambiguous decision. We should not work with ambiguity. We should not live with ambiguity. Then how to live with this? So here again, we have to do another test. Another hypothesis test, another sample correction. Say suppose you have to take that, okay, it increased. If it increased, then I can take another mu value, say 600, and then again repeat the test, and whether I have to accept it or not. And this way I can conclude that, okay, it is increased or decreased. I hope you have understood. Yeah, yeah. So hypothesis testing is not the one time job. It is a repeated testing procedure with trial and then check that, OK, which can be more conclusive based on majority of voting. And then only you can confirm that sale has increased. And then if it is not decreased, whatever it is there. OK, and now I am discussing one method. There is another method also I will discuss that is called the confidence interval method. That will give you more okay, concrete result. That is actually to live with this ambiguity. That is an alternative method I will discuss. Anyway, what I can say, I repeat it again so that you should not lose your confidence. The idea is that we, we test mu equals to 500 and alternate hypothesis that mu greater than 500. We reject this hypothesis. This rejection implies that sale either increased or decreased. Now, in order to confirm whether really sale have decreased or increased, then we have to perform another hypothesis testing with another mu values. And then, okay, to decide that whether this mu value stands right conclusive for our decision or not. And this way, repeated things, and then we can come into the conclusion that, okay, the actual fact what happens. And this is the hypothesis testing procedure. I repeat that it is not the one time. We have to repeat it with different, what is called the hypothesis and then different testing. That's all, okay? Yes, sir. Okay, let's proceed further. Then there are many other, right? Uh, uh, many other glitches and many things are there. I will point it out, whatever I can do, and then I can discuss, but I want to proceed further so that uh, discussion can be two and four like so we can back again and then we can discuss it again but i will point out whatever the things that is usually occur and people whenever i was learning that time also i faced many kind of questions of my own and then i tried to solve of my right own and then and anyway so i'll, I'll just okay, share my experience now let's proceed with the second case study because see after discussing three case studies many things will be clear automatically that i feel and even if it is okay, some points are not clear, I will uh, take special care to discuss them. Now let's come to the case study two. Now this example, as I said, are jet test. So I have chosen three case studies. One corresponding to two tests, which just now I have discussed. Another jet test and then chi-square test. So now, right now I'm going to discuss about the jet test. Now let us consider a problem definition first and then the five different steps that is that needs to be followed will be discussed one by one. Now, this is one example. Uh, this example is very simple. It is actually to check the accuracy of a machine, whether machine is working correctly or not. Right? Now, what is this machine? You know, the medicine production, right, where medicine is produced, 
and it needs to be uh, packaged into a bottle. So usually this packaging or is a bottling is done by a machine. So suppose you have to prepare a medicine of a tube of eight milliliter content, right? And then uh, you use a machine for this purpose. So medicinal drop will be poured into the tube and then capacity of the tube will be eight milliliter and that is to be done by a automatic machine. So in order to measure, take the okay control that whether machine is working properly or not, so you need to do a hypothesis testing for the purpose. So my objective is to test the machine whether it is working correctly or not. That means if it puts eight milliliter in every tube, then I can say that machine is working perfectly. But if it does not, then mean in some bottle less than eight milliliters, in some bottle more than eight milliliter, then I can say that machine does not working properly. But in that case, I should consider that, okay, how much tolerance that I can allow. Okay, so eight milliliter, whether 8.001 is tolerance or 7.999 is tolerance or even 8.0 one is tolerable or 7.9 is tolerable. That is actually my jurisdiction. Okay, so I will decide it. Now let's see to test this hypothesis, then definitely I need some samples. So from the production line at random interval, I have collected 16 tubes, okay, after bottling, and then I consider them as a sample. And my tolerance level is measured as a variance that can be allowed 0 0.2. So 8.2, within it is fine, but if it is 8.3, then machine is not working correctly. Similarly, 7.8, if it is fine, but if it is 7.7 .7 or 7.75, then it is not correct. Okay, so it is my tolerance. That is actually this tolerance is measured by means of the calculation of variance. So 0 0.2 is the variance. So sigma square is equals to 0 0.2. Now here you can understand that this variance is given to you so this means it is your population variance. So your population, that means your bottle, can allow to have varying from your mean level as the 0 0.2. And here is the mean, what is the mean value? Your mean value is eight. Now, so we can write, perform the test here as the, and assume that the distribution follow normal distribution. Okay, we have confirmed it, but it is given that, okay, population follow the normal distribution. And then population variance is known so if the population follow normal distribution, population variance is known, and we have to compare population mean given from a sample mean, then, then it is a problem of Z test. So it is actually, okay, this is a case under the Z test. Now let's see what are the different five steps. First step is that we have to decide the hypothesis, null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis. So null hypothesis is eight zero, that means mu equals to eight. It is absolutely okay. And what about the alternate hypothesis? Now, alternate hypothesis is that my machine is not working correctly. My machine is not working correctly. It, it means that sometimes machine is putting little medicine. Sometimes in some bottles, it is more than the required content, required volume. So it is actually mu one, uh, sorry, H one. That means mu is not equals to eight. That is the right choice for the two hypotheses without any hesitation, without any doubt. Doubt. I hope this is perfectly is okay. So our first step is the specification of hypothesis is that H zero is mu equals to eight. The alternate hypothesis is mu is not equals to eight. And one more thing is that significance level. Okay, as is the standard practice of our hypothesis testing, let us assume without any anonymity, without any okay, uh, debate argument, alpha is 0 0.05. That means 5% is the level of significance. That means alpha is the 5% probability of error is allowed. Type one error is 5%. Okay, so this step one is fine to everybody, I hope. If anybody has any doubt, let me know so that I can take your doubts and then try to convince yourself. It's okay to everybody, right? Okay. Now our second step. The second step, as I said to you, that from the data collected from the sample, we have to calculate sample statistics. 
So that fine. So n is 16. This is the size of the sample. And from the sample that we have collected, right? From the 16 sample, the data I have not given here. It is just an array of data. From the sample, I collect that the sample mean is 7.89. That is, I have cal calculated. The detailed data is not shown here, but it is from the sample calculation. It is there. Now here, sigma is 0 0.2. Okay, it is actually standard deviation. Assume that it is not. I told that variance. It is actually sample deviation. Okay, so standard deviation 0 0.2. Sigma is 0 0.2. No issue. And with the sample state statistics, so Z value because we want to do the Z table. So Z value needs to be calculated. So this is the sigma that we have calculated. So this is the sigma, right? And this is the X bar. And this is the mu, that is the assumed mu, the hypothesized mean. And N is the sample size. Now this gives the value 2.20. So we can take the Z actually value it is. So it is equals to 2.20. So this is the Z value that we can get it from the sample data. Now this is the Z value that we can calculate it. And we need to check whether this 2.20 Z value for this sample that we have collected is lying inside the rejection region or inside the acceptance region that we need to test. Now this test to do that, we have to know the region, rejection region boundary. And for the rejection region boundary, we can consult the Z distribution table. Now the Z distribution table, it is actually the 2.20. And so it is actually we have to see that what is the, the Z value for which uh, probability of Z by Z0 is 2.20. So this will give you uh, the rejection region. Now from the Z table, right, we can see for alpha equals to 0 0.05, right, uh, that PZ that can be calculated from the table as 1.96. So for this 1.96, right, and then alpha 0 0.5, alpha is basically the error probability. So we have to check that this alpha occurs in the J table in which row. As I said, it is 1.96. So this is the Z value that it is greater than 1.96. Right. And again, it is a two test table. So actually it needs to be tested with 0 0.25. Right. Because there are two rejection boundary. So it is here anyway. So 1.96 is the rejection boundary that we can get it from the table okay that you can check it right uh, should i show you the z table so that we can how you can find 1.96 from there i think you will you will be able to do that okay so from the z table i can get it so 1.96 is my rejection boundary now from the test data what we got is that this z value lying as a 2.20 so it is here right so 2.20 means it is in the rejection region. So therefore, uh, so it is rejected. So we can reject the null hypothesis H0. So reject the null hypothesis means that simple interpretation is that machine is not working correctly. So here we need to adjust or uh, repair the machine. So that is the conclusion. So this is the case study. And I hope again it is the same as the key test, but you can understand about it. Now here few points that we can elaborate on. So there are few comments that may come from your side also. If you can read of your slide and the slide, you can okay. All those comments will come here, but let me point out what are the comments that can come here. Now, if we change the value of alpha instead of 0 0.05, whether the Inference will be different or it will remain same. Now in that case, so these are the two hypotheses, same, but we have changed this value alpha. Again, if you repeat the step, and then here, this is the 2.576 that can be obtained from the test table where 0.01 is looking there. So it is that 2.2567, the new rejection boundary can be obtained 
and as you check that rejection boundary has changed right from 1.976 to 2.576 as alpha is decreases as alpha is decreases rejection boundary moves towards left or towards right actually right more so it moves towards right and okay this one and from the test data same result we can obtain it so it is a 2.20 and therefore if we compare here 2.20 and 2.756 then what we can say that the rejection boundary is beyond this one that mean here the hypothesis that we can write here actually if we see it is like this so it is the mu equals to 8 and so this is the calculated right so for the t z uh, distribution table 2.576 2.576 and from the sample data the z table can obtain it is here 2.20 so this is the z value right so 2.20 Now, so this says that this is inside the acceptance region. So we, so based on this alpha value, right, the 0.01, we accept this hypothesis H0. So we accept this hypothesis H0 means now we can conclude that machine is working correctly. So we, this is the alpha equals to 1%, right? That's fine. So you can understand that, okay, here, the error will be less. So it is better, more conservative test. When alpha is five, it is more liberal test. Okay, so it is there. Now another case maybe, say suppose you have collected the sample here, for your sample, this value is calculated, 7.89. Now you could either increase the size of the sample or take another sample of the same size. Let us consider the second situation. You consider another 16 bottles, but at another occasion, okay, another production line, another production day, and then take it. Now, that may not be same, 7.89. That may be different. Let us consider another case, that's 7.91. And then let us consider alpha again, same as 0 0.05. So these are the two hypotheses. Alpha remains same as earlier. Variance also the same that we can say about it. Only the thing is that X bar is 7.9. Now again, if we repeat all the step, so this is the 1.96 for alpha. It is that is the boundary region, critical value of the boundary region. And here this will change. X bar 7.99, and this will give 1.80. Now for this sample. And even alpha is 0 0.5 because 1.80 and this is 1.96. So it is right, it is far right towards the acceptance region. So it is in the acceptance region. 1.80 is in the acceptance region. Therefore, we accept 808. Okay, so now you can understand that earlier for the same values of alpha, but for a different sample. We reject hypothesis, but when the with different sample value, it is accepted the hypothesis. This means that for the same type one error probability, but for the different size sample, it can give the different inference, the different results. That means it is sensitive to sample, but again, this sensitiveness is measured by how much probability of error you are allowing. Now, if I ask you to repeat the same problem, this problem again, X bar is 7.91, but with alpha is 0 0.01. You may find the different inference, different conclusion. So these are the different things. That means all the statistical testing, the hypothesis testing is sensitive to many, what is called the testing uh, values that you have considered. So it can, right? depending on what kind of confidence that you want to have in your testing and how much sample. Now, again, if you ask me, okay, sir, alpha is same, but different sample, then what should be my conclusion? So here again, ambiguity. 
for sample 7.89 i reject it for sample 7.91 i accept it so what will be my final conclusion to my boss if i want to report the result then my suggestion is that you should not write sit idle doing only two test let us make 10 test then take the majority of voting that is the concept out of 10 if you see three is in favor of accepting null hypothesis and seven is not in favor then you can say more confidently rejecting the hypothesis otherwise you have to do it alternatively so these are the procedure see hypothesis testing is a probabilistic things and for the probability for example if i ask you to toss the coin coin and you know the probability that a head will come is 0.5 and probability that tail will come 0.5 now you can do 10 tosses and in 10 toss you can check that head comes 4 and tail comes 6 then what you can say to your student that what is the probability is 0.4 is for head and 0.6 this you cannot do it so what you can do you can repeat the test with 50 tosses the result will be mid little bit towards your more right maturity right in that case you can see the 0.48 maybe the head 0.52 maybe the tail now repeat the test for 500 tosses you can see the 0.499 maybe for tail and 0.5001 maybe head again repeat 5000 and then you can check that result is in favor of you 0.5000 for head and 0.5000 for your tail it is like this so testing is like so whenever testing with probability is in the picture it is not that one time job you have to do it several times and then finally it is there so it is if you write a program if you have the different samples and then you can test it and then you can conclude the final thing and then you can report the result so this is the procedure okay now so this is the second case that i told you and with the different variations that i told you now here again the reporting the summary of the result so for the case study is concerned a0 is rejected with x bar 7.89 a0 is not rejected with x bar 7.91 in both cases i have consider alpha is 0.04 again for the same sample but different alpha a0 is rejected a0 is not rejected this is obvious because what kind of confidence what kind of error probability that you want to include in your result so later is more conservative and then the previous one with alpha 0. Point, it's little bit liberal so it is there so as the error probability changes so that is why conclusion may change now again the question is that which one the right value of alpha that should be considered and then i can take more confidently that okay with this error probability my result is sound so definitely again if you continue with the different values of alpha alpha is 0.01 alpha 0.02 alpha 0.03 and so many tests are there then you can say it and then you can have little bit clear picture that up to this values of alpha and with this sample i can tell this and after this values of alpha this one so this test is subject to certain limitation and that is alpha value but you know this is also little bit time consuming not so cost effective process and as a result it is better that if we think something a better idea about it and this is a majority of the question that okay this concept may have certain difficulties now to deal with this there is a better concept that concept is called the p value concept now p value concept is an alternative idea where you don't have to specify the value of alpha a priori in the previous testing i told that first consider the value of alpha which is the step on itself and then follow the five steps in the testing but the p value concept says that you don't have to take the values of alpha a priori rather right suggest the p value based on the sample now let's see what is the procedure now p value concept come into the question because many data analyst 
do not have a fixed or definitive idea about what should be the appropriate value for alpha for the hypothesis testing. Using a specified level of significance value of alpha that we have discussed, a decision reverse even for a minor change in sample statistics. Here, okay. So here, as you see, for the different 7 point, right, 8, 9, and 7.9, if the minor changes in the sample value, but for the same alpha, the decision is different. So here is the problem. For a specified level of significance, decision can be different if there is a little change in the sample statistics. So that is why as an alternative or to deal with these issues, there should be a proper method, a better method to report the result of hypothesis testing. And this method is better if we don't mention or we don't start with the prior value of level of significance. Then, okay, then how? So if I don't mention that type one error probability, then how confident my decision maker will be, my boss will be to take my result. So it is up to the decision maker. So decision maker can take this test with this level of significance, with this p-value concept. I will come to the discussion of p-value or not. Now let us see what exactly the concept of p-value is in hypothesis testing. It's very simple. The idea is that p-value as the name p-value. So what is the p? p is actually probability value. That is a p-value. So p-value is the probability of committing type 1 error. If the actual sample value of the statistics is used as the boundary of the rejection region. Now here is the thing that you can find the idea about it that. So here this p-value is used as the boundary of the rejection region. Now you note earlier the boundary of the rejection region is chosen by the alpha value. But here p-value is chosen as the boundary. Now what is the p-value? p-value is the actual sample value of statistics. For example, x bar is a sample value and it is say 7.89 is the sample value suppose. Okay, so corresponding to this 7.89, what is the z0 that can be obtained from the z value formula or t formula, whatever it is there, that will give you the boundary. So this boundary is decided not from the table. Here, no table is required to consult only this calculation. So it is also very easy, right? And from the sample, it can decide the boundary. And for that boundary, we can report the result that, okay, for this test, it is the same. And this p-value is the smallest level of significance. Because if you take alpha value anything, this or this, whatever it is there, but it is the smallest value for which H0 is to be rejected. That means if it more than this value, then that H0 will be reje rejected. But it is the smallest value that, okay, it will be rejected. Otherwise, for any other P value, right, which is larger than this Z0 will be accepted. So this is the concept of, right, P value. Now let's see one example so that you can understand how the P value can be calculated. So the calculation of P value is state, uh, pretty straightforward. As I said to you, P actually that can be calculated from the table. If Z0 is calculated from your sample data, so it is what is the probability that it can be calculated. So this P value is actually this one, right? So it is actually this P value. Now, if it is a one tail test, this is one. If it is a two tail test, this will be multiplied by two. That's all. Nothing else. So the P calculation is very straightforward rather. Okay. Now let us one consider an example so that you can understand this concept. Now, this is one hypothesis testing where we have to test this null hypothesis. Alternate hypothesis is this one. So it is a two-tail test. And for a sample which obtained, and this is the sample data, n the size is the variance, and x bar is the sample mean. So z0 can be calculated from all these data here. It is like this. So 2.20. Now, so p value. That can be calculated because of two tests. So Z greater than Z0, that means here Z0 is 2.0. So we can calculate that this value is 0. So this is from the table that you can get it, 0 0.0139 multiplied by. So it is 2.278. It is approximately 3%. 
So here, for this example, p value is 3 percent. Then what I can say is that this sample says that you accept the hypothesis with 3 percent as the type of one error. Now you take another sample. Then that sample, if suggests around 3 percent, that's fine. If you take another sample, if it takes 1 percent, then you can stick to that 1 percent is the type one error and another sample, this is one. So you can repeat the test with different sample and then minimum p-value that you can get. And then based on this value, you can report the result. And that is you can say, and then boss, you can take that, okay, so much confidence I am having, so far the error is concerned, and this is my result. So see, this is the idea of the p-value. And here, we don't have to think the alpha value a priori, only the value can be calculated from the sample and then we can report the result with this one. So this is the p-value concept. Here are many interpretations from the p-value that we can easily do it. The example which we have given just now is the probability of type 1 error is 3 percent with that sample that we have considered. The null hypothesis is rejected with level of significance 0 0.0278 or higher. That is obvious. The inference of population mu is equals to 8 is acceptable with 3 percent error or 97 percent accuracy. And as you have already mentioned, we, not to, we, not, we don't require any right specification so far the significance level of concern at the beforehand of the testing. Reporting results with p-value is a better information for decision makers from data analytics. So being a data analytics, if you report p-value, it is a better information to your right boss regarding the decision that you got it based on your test. Okay, so this is the idea that we have, but case study three, I don't think that I shall start it today. I'll take another class, one more class is required where I can conclude the other portion. There are a few more things also to be discussed. So case study three, few more critical comments on the hypothesis testing. Finally, I'll discuss an alternative test of hypothesis called the confidence interval method. Okay, that will be uh, tomorrow, uh, two day after tomorrow on Thursday morning class. It's okay, fine. Now, if you have any question, uh, please let me know. Okay, I can, we can discuss on your question because we have little bit time and so that we can go on taking some question. Any question? Sir? Yes, please. Sir, can you go back to slide 44? Yeah, sure. Slide 44, right? This slide? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the one before that. Okay. To tell. Yeah. Uh, the question is that why is that uh, one tail goes 0.05 percent and two tail goes 0.01 percent, something like that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this one, this one, yeah. Right. No, I told you one tail test means what? One tail test means either less than or greater than. So far, the Com comparing mean value is concerned. Is it correct? Yes. If it is greater than, then only your rejection region will be one side only. If it is less than, then it is also another side only. Right? So yes. they are one tailed. That means one side, either left tail or right tail. You get it? Yes, yes. Okay. But suppose if it is not less than only or not greater than only, but not equal only, right? Not equal means not equal means it can be less than as well as it can be greater than. So it is less than plus greater than. So probability that it is less than plus probability that it is greater than. So there are two. That is why I told about 
that two test is here. One tail test means the probability that Z0 is less than, right? It is the right tail. And pro probability that Z is greater than Z0, it is a left tail. So they are one tail. For the two tail, P is greater than Z0 plus P less than Z0. Right? And is a two tail. So two pluses are there. Now here, alpha is the probability. If it is a one tail, then the area bound alpha is the probability means I told you that is the area bounded by the curve. So that is only the so if it, alpha is five percent, then the probability is 0 0.05. If alpha is five percent, but it is if it is a two tailed, so this probability will be distributed both sides of the curve. That means both left side as well as for the right side. That is why the two areas. So it will be divided and is a symmetric, so equally divided. So this way, this way. So here, here you see uh, for alpha is five percent, but it is for the two tailed. So both side. So alpha by two is in the left side, alpha by two in the right side. Okay, that is why alpha is equals to 0 0.05 and divided by two, so it is 0 0.025 in both side. I yes. hope you got it. Yes, I got it. Yes. So these are the things that you have to be a little bit careful while you are giving the answer to tail and accordingly consult the test table and then get the result, right? That is only the thing. Okay, so few problems you need to practice. I'll give you a few problems so that uh, for your practice or even, uh, okay, uh, we can discuss few more problems also. Anyway, if time permits. Any other question from anybody else? Okay, then if you don't have any question, I advise you to go through the slides and then, okay, and then try to understand the concept with your own space so that you can right, better understand. 